What we'd like to do now is to bring all the speakers back uh, to uh, have a seat at the table here uh, and uh, to have a discussion to pick up questions and issues that uh, we didn't have time to let you ask earlier. Uh, let me say something to all of the Googlers in the room. This is a public meeting. We have people here from outside of Google. So let's be a little thoughtful about the questions and issues that you raise uh, in this session. Uh, if there are matters that need to be dealt with internally, please hang on to those for now and we'll deal with them later. Uh, so at the moment, though, I think we want to uh, take advantage of the fact that we have real experts with burned fingers uh, who've been dealing with IPv6 in one way or another for quite some time. Uh, so I'm going to simply open the floor for uh, uh, questions. But I'd like to suggest that we might start to, by finding out whether any of the speakers want to react or respond to the things that their uh, colleagues have said uh, before we begin general questions and answers from the floor. So let me first invite the speakers to raise any issues you think uh, need clarification or perhaps debate. I don't see anyone levitating out of their chairs. So that means you all agreed with each other somehow. So I, I had uh, working, yes, yeah, so I, I had one point, at least I, that I had hoped someone would make. Um, Apple's done a re an interesting thing with their new airport, the Airport Extreme or something, I forget what they call it. And it's got V6 in it, and it's very easy to turn on um, the automatic tunneling. I don't know where what the where it's tunneling to, but if you turn it on, then then it does RAs back on the you know on the wireless side, and you get V6 access. And I, it's, I, it's yeah. by turning one thing on, it just works and it's automatic. I, I have to say, I'm using a Macintosh. I turned on the enable IPv6, and it, it seemed to work without any uh, special effort on my part. Um, the thing you were probably talking about is the airport base station, and then the other devices are airport extremes that extend the uh, wireless uh, to further distances in order, you know, by repeating the signal. Yes, sir. Uh, we're taking questions you want from us to the floor. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one other, Alan. I would like to make a point on the Apple airport base station. So they have made a conscious decision to treat it as a stateful firewall, meaning that they will think that anything originating from inside of a network is fine, and anything that will originate from outside of a network is treated as dangerous, same way as a NAT box is. And uh, uh, that's interesting in the sense that it will prevent us from putting devices into the home network um, that we will control. And uh, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, if we are thinking about today, we have set of boxes that have their own cable modem, so they attach directly to a cable plant, so we control them like this. But in the future, if you want to go to an all IP network and uh, have those devices simply being an IP device, if we cannot access to this device, it's a bit of an issue. So that's why, at the end of my talk, I was talking about this new social contract and what does it mean to have a shared management of the access point for services that are either offered by the service provider or by a third party. So the simple model saying everything from the outside is bad is a little bit too simplistic in the future. Uh, I'd like to reinforce that uh, with two examples. One of them is that uh, I would like, for example, to be able to manage all of my IP-enabled devices at home, including the entertainment system, through the public Internet. I would like to be able to uh, subscribe to services that will help me manage those devices. And so I need to be able to reach them from the outside public Internet, and I wouldn't be permitted to do that under some circumstances. The other observation is that I found uh, viruses propagating inside the firewall almost as easily as they come from outside as people wander in with USBs who, whose uh, <clears throat> history isn't necessarily known. You know, where have they been plugged in before they got inside the uh, corporation? Okay, we got lots of people lined up to ask questions, so go. Hi, Bruce Hanna with uh, Google Corporate Network Engineering. So the future of the Internet, I've seen multiple talks today 
showing multiple layers of NAT, sometimes double or triple layers of NAT, V4 to V4, V6 to V4, and everywhere in between. Um, given the amount of potential breakage of end-to-end -end that we've got happening, what is the future of the sort of mythical garage software entrepreneur, uh, the person who can write an application, get it deployed virally, and essentially start a new industry or a new business or something, um, given that it appears to be it's going to get much more difficult to actually deploy something uh, without NAT boxes and therefore centralized control getting in the way? Where are we going to be in five years? So... Uh one of the reasons why we have been looking at this NAT v4, v6, v4, is that it forces us to have a v6 connectivity into the house. So you can look at this NAT as a necessary evil, but temporary, meaning that you have an alternate path. What it means for Google is, for example, if somebody has v4, and as Shin Miyaka was just show it, maybe if you display a map, it will take 10 minutes to display a map of San Francisco airport. If you go to V6, then it will display immediately. So that actually creates an incentive for content delivery players in this industry to move to V6. And that's why I think it's a better system than a V4, V4, V4 NAT that will lock us into a pure V4 environment without any escape toward the V6 world. So I think in all this discussion of NATs, I think the one thing maybe that didn't get said was that the idea here is that you've, we've noticed that if you do V6 to V4 net, you, you can get the same access to the V4 internet that you had before, have today, essentially through net. But you can still run, but the idea is that you also run V6 in parallel to that. So a V6 destination, you can go directly, not through the net. There's some more comments here. Please go ahead, Jim. Actually, uh, sure. Uh, the the double net you know, allows the people to use only very typical application on top of the TCP or maybe the very simple UDP from inside to outside. No dynamic DNS can be allowed. And how about the UPnP punching hole? Doesn't work. Which means MSN chat or maybe the Skype need to have them on some server you know, to exchange their stream. You know, not only for the signaling. I don't know much about the Google Talk. So, you know, you need to think about that and you know, such kind of centralized server in that circumstances. So, you know, no P2P anymore in the double nut, right? So what I'm hearing is NTT's mechanism is going to start breaking applications that exist today. You're, yeah. Then, You're correct. <laughs> you are correct. This well, sucks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. It yeah. sucks, for, for and it's inevitable. Fall. Is the but, problem, but the you know then we just uh, can be enforced to move IP version six. You know then you know we'd like to drive the people to encourage to use IP version six to get freedom as original internet. You know we I completely agree with Landy. You know we keep internet as a one single internet, not to divide it, but then. Uh, I don't know, you know, how to keep survive in a you know existing IPv4 world without any good you know, enough numbers of the IPv4 address. That's just a very simple message. So lots of application will be died if that stick to the IPv4. Uh, Randy, did you have a comment? A uh, friend was once over for dinner and we asked him whether he wanted broccoli or cauliflower, and he said, "Would you rather be run over by a car or a truck?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's parallel to what Shin is saying, which that's you know, you want massive V4 netting or you want six to four. Um, and it sucks caterpillar snot, and there's no way around it is the problem if we want to scale. What I don't like hearing is centralized servers. Centralizations we know is grim. But um, the big thing is how well can people make some of these NATs so that they can hold some significant state so that th that's going to be the real trade-off holding the edge is if they can hold enough state that you can scale it. And I think we've okay. had our head in the sand about NATs for a long time, so we haven't really pushed it. 
And now that we see people proposing that's closer to this core, maybe some of the somebody's going to throw real hardware at it. We'll see. Okay, what, that's one more comment from Alan, and then we'll go to David. What's going to be interesting is to compare the price of this NAT box in ISP NAT box with the price of the IPv4 addresses that we will save. <laughs> Good point, David. So talking a bit about the, the edge and back to the um, Apple Airport Extreme uh, case, I recently discovered or was told by someone at Apple that their Apple's back to the Mac functionality is actually derived off um, IPv6, that when you turn it on, you're actually turning on IPv6 connectivity internally within your network, and you're able, if you have the appropriate hardware in Airport Extreme and you've turned it on in .Mac and drunk all the Apple Kool-Aid, you're actually able to get to your home devices behind your Apple Airport Extreme through V6. And I've actually done that here um, with my laptop and going through all of it. Um, the relevance to um, sort of on the edge is these boxes, the Airport Extreme boxes, 150 bucks or something. Um, and it handles my home network, which is probably a little more unusual than, than most, um, without any significant stress. Um, so you're actually able to push the scaling issues out towards the edge um, if you have people who are willing to buy into one vendor's particular implementation. And that gets into the centralization issue that Randy was raising. Um, but it's just one of the, another one of the examples of where IPv6 is sort of insinuating itself without a lot of people even being aware of it. Problem there, David, is that You've got a V4 address at the edge. Yes, I, Ed, yes I'm on, and, and I'm that, on Comcast network. I'm using but, but 6 to got 4. It, which, the thing is, yes. the, the tension that's happening is, if that translation's happening at the edge, then all the edge has V4 addresses, and you've limited the size of the edge. OK, yes. Hi, yeah. My name is Zhou Pingsheng. I work at Google. Uh, I have a question about uh, the fundamental of IPv6 is that we see a lot of people doing the deployment, but I'm just wondering whether any of the panels are actually uh, proud of IPv6. Means you really think this is the right thing to do? Because for me, I feel that we have a bunch of very smart people in a room working on a product that none of us are proud of. I think there's something wrong. Well, uh, uh, at least speaking for myself, I'm very proud of V6 and the work we've done to get it this far, and I just want to make sure it gets to the end. So we've completed the transition. But, yeah, I, I think it's been – I started working on it at the beginning because I knew it was going to be really important for the Internet. <clears throat> and my focus is, continues to be making the Internet continue to be successful, and I think V6 is essential to do that. Any other comments? Uh, I'm sure it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just speaking for myself, like I said earlier this morning, I really do believe that V6 is the, uh, the only thing that we can do right now to make sure that address space is available and that we preserve as much as possible the end-to-end -end structure of the network. So, Can uh, I get one other comment in here? So uh, you reminded me of something. So back when, you know, Vint and everyone were starting – you know, the V4, the current Internet was not a sure thing back, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And there were lots of... I, I'm sorry, it's 30 years ago. because sorry, the decision. No, I'm serious. The decision to put a 32-bit address space on there was the result of a year's battle among a bunch of engineers who couldn't make up their minds about 32, 128, or variable length. And after a year of fighting, I said, I'm now at ARPA. I'm running the program. I'm paying for this stuff. We're using, you know, American tax dollars. And I wanted some progress because we didn't know if this was going to work. So I said, okay, it's 32 bits. It's enough for an experiment. It's 4.3 billion terminations. <laughs> Even the defense department doesn't need 4.3 billion of everything and couldn't afford to buy 4.3 billion edge devices to do a test anyway. So at the time, I thought we were doing an experiment to prove the technology and that if it worked, we'd have an opportunity to do a production version of it. Well, it, it, you know, it, it just escaped. It got out, and, and people started to use it, and then it became a commercial uh, thing. 
So we're really, this is the production uh, attempt at making the network scalable. So, well, only 30 years later. Yes, Elise. Yeah, I just want to mention uh, not being proud. I don't know why that came up, but um, anytime you're designing something, you always want to do the best you can at the time. And hindsight is wonderful because then you realize you overlooked something you should have thought of in the beginning. So V6 is the same thing. If we de we're designing it now, it might be different than it is today. But back when it was being decided upon, there were compromises and uh, battles. There were the tuba battles and everything else. So um, I don't think it's people aren't proud of it, but hindsight is a good way to point fingers at things and say, oh, well, if we'd only known then what we know now. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, believe me, if you didn't live through the uh, IPNG battles, next generation battles, you uh, have to appreciate the enormous scope of debate uh, and argument that, and different designs that led ultimately to compromise that's called IPv6. Yes, sir? So you said a lot about, like, corporate networks and whatnot, but I'm sitting here thinking if and when, you know, IPv6 moves to the edge, how does it affect, like, my mom? You know, she has a you know, a NAT router that allows her to connect like a laptop and a printer and, you know, and a few other devices. And, you know, even even assuming that, that there would have to be a new device to allow for IPv6, I mean, how do you deal with the security implications? He's talking about, you know, being able to access all his devices from outside. Some people may not want that. <laughs> Actually, one of the answers for that question is, you know, without notice. You know, the... Today is a CP device and sometimes automatically upgraded due to the security you know, patches, right? Mm -hmm. so the same mechanism can be applied to upgrade you know, firmware to be uh, dual stack and you know, compatible. Then in that case, you know, if the people just you know, purchase a new PC from the price, you know, bister on it. So people just use it without notice. Mm -hmm. If upstream is completely dual stack, right? Mm -hmm. So then my mom or maybe the any grandmother utilizing email, you know, doesn't we don't won't know which protocol is she is using. That's just fine. I think one of the big difference between V4 and V6, if you look at the edge, uh, if I consider what I'm getting attached to my home network, right now a small description, uh, five PCs, PlayStation, PSP, mobile phone. Uh, video camera, sensor. Uh, if you try to reach those, uh, and by the way, uh, NAS server as well, if you try to reach this device from the internet, what does your mom needs to do? She has to go on the CP device. <coughs> she has to know about DNS port mapping. She has to know about the IP address. She has to know about the TCP port. Do them apply the mapping and make sure everything is right before she can access the device. If you go to V6, that's exactly what I do with my device. I only put my device reachable from the internet using IPv6. No. I, I guess no. what I'm asking. That's horribly broken. She shouldn't have to know any of that. Yeah, that's to right. drive a car, I don't need to, should not need to be a mechanic. Yeah. The tension here is between security and the end-to-end -end principle. The fact is that if we want truly end-to-end -end network, then that's going to expose all your mom's devices. That's right. And the question is, how much do you want to break the end-to-end -end principle to provide what kind of security? And I don't have an answer for that. I do. Well, I guess another question is... I'm sorry. Uh, I do uh, have an answer, uh, and, or at least <laughs> a speculation. One of the things that's very clear is that if you are going to have devices that are generally exposed to the rest of the world, and oh, by the way, they are exposed even in the NAT box. I mean, anybody who's drinking Kool-Aid that says a NAT box provides security, you should go, you know, <clears throat> get yourself uh, cleaned out at a clinic somewhere. Um, but the, the point is that you need to start building in mechanisms that will allow the configuration of these devices to only interact with devices that are essentially authorized. And that's the, the challenge here, I think, is getting the user interfaces so that implicitly the right kinds of authorizations and controls are, in, are put in place without the users having to understand any of the details of addressing or DNS or anything else. But it does feel to me as if you have to build those mechanisms in and make them easily configured. Yes. I think regarding the home environment, which is what has 
been mentioned in this context, uh, we need to remember that the platforms that we have with IPv6 enabled now, such as Vista, come as a default in home versions with a strong firewall. And this applies to most Linux distributions as well. And by default, it's on. So this is almost this discussion is almost um, a non-discussion because you either have your security through NAT by breaking the connectivity or you have it by buying something that has IPv6 and, and by the very nature of having IPv6 built in also has an IPv6 firewall. Mm. Yeah. I would like to add to this that this is all nice and well, but NAT is really, really entrenched everywhere. Uh, I've been talking to some of our internal folks and business people and saying about, oh, there's an opportunity to not have a NAT box and to connect to devices. And they say, no, 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 no way, no way. NAT has to be there to provide security. So even that, I, I know that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way it is. And we may wish otherwise, but unfortunately, in the mind of a l very large number of people, NAT is there to provide security. Yeah. So whatever we have to invent, we'll have to somehow work around this perception problem, not technical problem. Okay, let's keep going. Lorenzo. So um, um, in the trade-off between security and end-to-end, um, -end, uh, hey, if I lock my computer up and I unplug it, it's very secure. But um, this is not the so, question. So is a brick. <laughs> Um, that's not the question I wanted to ask. Um, the question I keep asking at meetings every time is um, when people say to me, hey, you are Google, you should do IPv6 so that people will follow you and uh, you, you need to provide content because otherwise there will be no edge because uh, chicken and egg problem. So my question is this, you know, this is for the panel, for the floor, for anyone who has an answer. How do I, suppose... Suppose I could I had this magic wand and I make Google's network IPv6 ready and it's you know production grade, industrial grade, the same as a V4 network. The IPv6 internet is broken, right? There are long tunnels, there is bad connectivity, there's no there's broken. I can't get to some places now with the transit we have now. Um, DNS uh, DNS uh, forwarders and NAT gateways are broken. You send them a quad A question and they and they give you an A answer back with the first four bytes of the V6 address in a V4 in a V4 address. All this breakage, right? How do we fix that? How how can how can Google look at you know look at the situation of the internet and say yes we're going to put up a quad A record for www.google.com? We can't do that, right? So how do we how do we as a content provider, even if we want to provide V6, how do we provide it? Well, it seems that, well, maybe we should see what our uh, guests say about that first. Come to Tokyo, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then you will see the, you know, 100 megabits, V6 ready connection to your house, apartment, right? But the guy in, in, in Europe who has a broken NAT box, he won't be able to get to Google. I, w I don't want to lose that, that guy. You know, right? actually, the, you know, then... The matter of what, you know, maybe you, Google, has also the competitors, like in a distributing a video streaming service, like Stage 6 or whatever. Then, in, especially in Far East Asia, as you may know about that, and lots of pressure is coming from lots of places just because IPv4 address is a shortage from China, the government, the Japanese enterprises, whatever. If somebody else, other than Google, will start IP version 6 Trump spotted video streaming service, just like YouTube. Entire Japanese and other you know, Far East Asian traffic probably goes to that site, not yours. Yes, but I how don't do think I... threatening Lorenzo is going to be productive. <laughs> so Lorenzo, the but, way you do me. it is document the problems publicly. And we work together to try and get them fixed. If you notice, yeah. that's what I've been trying to do. Expose time. these yeah. issues, talk about them honestly, and see what we can do as the best solutions to them. There ain't no magic. So, right. so, so I have yeah. to put up some publicly accessible service somewhere, tell everyone it's broken, and tell everyone, tell me, please tell me no, how it's no. broken, and so but, we can but, fix but it. But start telling the story okay. of Google trying to deploy V6, and here are the problems mm -hmm. we are hitting. Yeah. We don't want to take this next step 
because here's the breakage. Yeah. How can we take that next step so you, safely? Yep. So, so you bring up a service which you announce is not www.google.com. It's something else that's intended to help us expose the V6 issues. I think uh, we have uh, an interrupt here from uh, Susan. Uh, Suzanne, wait a minute. We'll get you a microphone. Thanks. Um, I'll talk a little bit more when it's my turn a little bit later and not to interrupt our panel, but what he said. Um, this is one of the things we're trying, certainly, with deploying V6 transport and quad A's for the route, is exactly get that kind of storytelling out there. Find the gaps and fix them. Yeah, I think we get, I get, we get points for that. Okay, Alan, one more, and then uh, we need to move on before we run so out of time. So I had um, a sentence in my slide, which is uh, try to decouple things. And another way to say it is uh, crawl, walk, run. So uh, trying to isolate a service and something new that you want to start that will be IPv6 and expose the problems will actually go a really, really long way instead of saying, oh, everything has to be V6 on the get-go. First, we cannot do anything. Decoupling things yeah. is really the key here. Okay. Uh, let's, shall we go on? Yeah, just one, one more. That's the reason why, at the end of my presentation, you know, I'm just proposing to set up some X day to negotiate, to synchronize from the ASP side and the network provider side to you know, they back everything. Yes, but how do I tell whoever boss nine, ten layers above me, we are going to turn it on on this day, and on this day we'll have a 10% or a 3% or whatever percent drop in the number of people that reach our website. How do I tell him that, right? That is, that is the problem. Lorenzo, that's my problem. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> and he's going to ask you, and how do we fix that? Right, and that's what Lorenzo's asking. It's not how do we face up to it. It's also how do we fix it? We are engineers. Right. I mean, th this is Joel Yegley. Um, currently, I guess I work for Nokia. Um, but uh, you mean you're I, not sure? <laughs> well, yeah. Thirteen years at the in academia, and it's all this is all new to me. You know, it's only been a year. Um, but I mean, the thing I see with with um, when we observe that IPv6 is broken or that we have problems um, with deployment. If we observe the problems that we observe in IPv6, in IPv4, we treat them as network outages, right? And we fix them because we're engineers and that's what we do. And um, when we build services um, that leverage IPv6, um, we instrument them and we observe problems and we respond to those and we treat them as what they are, which is brokenness, right? Um, you know, if you have a host that has an IPv6 default route, it's going to assume that it can talk to the rest of the world via that default route. It's a natural assumption. That's what happens with the v4 host. But if it can't reach the rest of the world via IPv6, then we go, well, v6 is broken. And if it can't reach the rest of the world via IPv4, we have a network outage. Right? Ah, yes. And so um, those are things that we address. Um, to, to, to talk to Lorenzo's point just a little bit, um, one place to address um, how you deal with um, instrumenting your customers and their ability to reach your applications is do it in places um, where you have control over the application space. So you, if you have an application um, where you have an opportunity to use both v4 and v6 um, and you can do so transparently, um, then you can try both at the same time. Right? instead of waiting for one to fail before using the other. This is uh, Alan's point about separation of, uh, uh, it, which uh, you used a different word for yeah. that, but can decoupling. I, right. yeah, decoupling, that's yeah. a very good example Because of that. Once, you can, once you can measure that um, with a few million data points, um, like, for example, say, Google Maps applications running on mobile devices, for example, then you have um, you know, a bun much more sensitive measurement of um, the quality of the network that you're using and what problems the users are experiencing um, without actually uh, shooting the users in the foot. So, I mean, I think that's um, you know, a really uh, valuable tool um, when you control the application environment. And um, you know, certainly Google has some applications that do that. Thanks. Can Thank I you. Just, oh. Tony. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, um, 
I mean, the ideal way to do that is to run things in parallel, essentially, under a different name. And if the chap from um, NTNT is correct, then Japanese users are going to start using that in preference because they're going to get better service and things will work that don't work on the V4 network. And, you know, the, the whole point of this is that it has to provide some value to, to people other than the addresses running out. People have to see some value in this, otherwise they're not going to want to change. Nobody's going to want to go out and spend another 100 bucks on another home NAT box or whatever. Uh, and by default, hopefully the next time they buy a home NAT box, it, it comes with V6 support already in it. But nobody's going to want to go out and do that unless there's some perceived advantage. Uh, and so, you know, for a while, just like V4 is going to exist with V6, maybe Google network services are going to have to exist in parallel in V6 and V4 versions under different names um, that, that people will get to um, depending on which one works better for them. Yeah, because the, as Randy said that, within a few years, two or three years, probably to get V4 global address is going to be more expensive than today, which means we do need an ISP need to late snap the subscription fee. That's very simple and enough reason our customer will switch from global V4 only subscription to Javstack, right? If price is different, if you think about that, and still if you can keep the same price as today, if you switch to the you know the subscription plan to the V6 to the private V4, but then we all at the same time we will ask them to raise up the subscription fee from next month. What's happening? Then probably they will you know online on site in a you know subscription or something like that. They will change their pro, you know subscription model right away. So then this is also the another scenario we will see within uh, two or three years. Just because, as Randy said that, we are looking, uh, we are thinking about that. You know, to get the IPv4 address is going to be more expensive than today, simply because. Uh, just one other observation. It's my sense that over uh, time, let us say in the next five years, that there may be an increasing likelihood of needing server-like functionality at home. And that mitigates against the kind of dynamic assignments that you get with NAT uh, and the private addressing that you get with NAT. So that might also uh, influence people's decisions. Tony. Yeah, yeah it's Tony Hayden. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Uh, sorry, there's just one, one more short comment. I, I'm just reminded of the similarity between this and the light bulb issue, where essentially power companies pay you to adopt the fluorescence rather than the incandescent light bulbs because they save so much money. So essentially, maybe ISPs and large <laughs> <laughs> well will make na will make the sort of the home boxes available at a really discounted rate That's so that they can start using IPv6 instead to reduce their own costs. That it could it, be it, it, at some point down the road that might be true. Um, you know, when when prices get to ten dollars per address per day, um, it becomes economically viable. Um, to Randy's point earlier um, about business models, as I talk to the service providers around the world, they're all standing around going, I don't have a business case. I'm going to do all of this. I'm going to get all done, and the content's still V4. Google's not v V6. I can't get there from here. That's the example that gets used constantly. So whether you like it or not, you're in the crosshairs. Um, to Lorenzo's point about what can you do, some simple measurement things that I thought about are put a zero you know, a single pixel image at the bottom of the page that is on a separate name that is a V6 only resolution. And you can get some statistics about the things that can get to you with V6 and not. Um, one of the things you have to think about is you are an edge. All of the talks today have been about the things for the core network. And for your core network, they're important. But you are an edge. Your client is the other edge. The transition tools were meant to decouple you from whatever happens in the network, right? So if the network can't get all of the broadband last mile loops done, you still got V4 in the middle of the loop, you're going to have to use transition tools to get across that. So those exist specifically for that case to get you so you can build your application. And you know, so you may end up running 6 to 4 and Teredo and you know, Mumble Mumble, whatever new one we have to create to make it work. In addition to having native V6, you can't just walk in and say, I'm going to do native V6 only. Right? If you do, you're going to have a very long page for Randy's document the cases. Yeah. 
Right? You do that plus these other things, and you start walking through the list. And I think when you get all done, we'll find that the problems aren't as big as they seem to be. It's stepping back and thinking about you, you are operating at both edges, and the middle is not necessarily cooperating. How can you make this work? So just if I understand your point, you're saying measure the quality of the IPv6 network by having a host name that is reachable somehow and use um, single pixel images or whatever it is to quantify the quality of that connectivity and at the same time try to use transition mechanisms like Teredo and stuff like that to get people to, to, to have that actually work on your production website? I think that's going to work. I, I don't. I don't think you jump straight to production, but I think you build up a website that is a little more broad based than just measurement. So in images. the meantime, what do people do? That's the question. What do they do? They type www.six.google.com into their browser. I think you might want to offer that as a service to see where it goes. You know, with the Apple Airport. Who's um, going to do that? That's that's the point, right? Who's going to type? The, the, there will be a number of us in this room that will type it and give you some statistics, which will make your documentation work. It doesn't give you massive scale, which you don't really want to begin with anyway. But then again, we, we fly around the world a lot, so. Yeah. We, we, we don't get a lot of oxygen. <laughs> but but up, I, up where we're at, it's, there, it, there's, there's one holes. significant point where I would disagree with you, Tony, which is it's not Lorenzo's to justify my business decision. He's not in my crosshairs. I'm sorry. I decided to go with V6 or not. That was my decision, and I did not put on Lorenzo that he has to justify that decision by choosing to spend his efforts. Understand, and and, and I'm not saying it's that not all that I service providers. It. No, I'm not saying that all service providers are that way. But the ones that are not doing V6, which are not the ones at the front of the room here, right? The ones that are not are using Google as the example of why they're not, right? The ones that have chosen to do it have chosen for other reasons. So that, that was the only... Okay, point. we have three more people in queue in just a few more minutes, so let's keep going. So I got on the Internet originally because it was this dream. I heard about this great thing where any computer could talk to any other computer across the globe, and I was excited. So in 92, I got my first Internet connection, which was $50 a month, 9600 baud, horrible. Within six months, I'd started my own ISP just so I could pay for a T1 line directly to my house. And it was awesome. I could get my DNS name for free. I just sent in a form, and they gave me a DNS name. I could add, ask for a block of addresses for free. I sent in a form, justified how many addresses I have, and I got a CIDR block. And then all of a sudden, they charged me $50 a year for a domain. And the whole Internet kind of spun out of control, got very corporate. And the dream disappeared where I couldn't talk from any computer to any computer because suddenly every computer in AT&T was hidden behind a couple of addresses with NAT. And the internet changed from what I originally dreamed of it to be. When IPv6 came out, I got excited again. Because people would always ask me, well, nobody's going to go to IPv6. It doesn't have a killer app. It doesn't have the web or something that draws people to it. And I've been trying to, maybe it's just in my own mind that I justify this because I'm a bit of a dreamer. My dream of IPv6 was the killer app will be innovation because it'll be the internet the way it was supposed to be. Every machine will be accessible from every other IP. There won't be a need for NAT, so everything can talk directly to each other. And I'm horribly depressed here today because I keep hearing, oh, we're going to start NATing all this stuff in IPv6 and gateways and translation. And it sounds like it's IPv4 all over again going down the same bad path of poor connectivity. You know, I, I can't log into my grandmother's computer and help her fix it because she's got a Linksys router that's blocking it and I don't want to have to t describe to her how to set up a translation to allow me to come in. It's Maybe. not IPv6 per se. It's the lack of a compatible transition, right? It's the incompatibility on the wire. And from then on, it tumbles. I would gladly follow any reasonable path out of that trap. Unfortunately... So Time no has path. left us none. It's depressing. Well, don't so be. Don't be I would use other words, but not in public. <laughs> uh, actually, we, we've learned over the last, let's say, at least twenty years, that uh, not everyone wants every computer to be able to communicate with every other one. What you would like, though, is that it's technically feasible for that to happen, except when you don't want to, and there are methods for preventing the communication from happening. We have to accept that that's part of the architecture that was missing 
from the original design, and it, we need to uh, reinstitute that. So it's not a surprise if you can't make everything talk to everything else, but what you would like is that that's a policy decision you make as opposed to an accident of engineering and implementation. Well, yeah, to, to be fair, I've been a security engineer for God knows how long now, and I'm probably partly responsible for going to all these major companies and putting in NAT policies and firewall filters. <laughs> But at the same time, with IPv6, you could have filtering and restrictions just by putting an access list without having to go with NAT. No, I'm the, agreeing. You know, I, I didn't in, intend to suggest sure. to you that NAT was the way you should achieve those constraints and restrictions. In fact, I don't like the idea of using NATs for that purpose. I prefer the idea of being able to configure constraints and filters that meet your policy requirements. Mm -hmm. we got several more people in the queue. Sure. Can we keep going? Uh, yeah. Just one more addition because it comes up is um, there are a number of businesses right now whose subscriber growth um, is contingent on an available pool of IPv4 addresses, um, and their subscribers are also your customers. Um, so um, when they can't grow their subscriber base because they can't get more IPv4 addresses, um, then they have some angry shareholders to answer to, um, but um, they also have fairly dire implications for um, – you know, uh, how they actually continue to manage their business. And um, so um, they have some serious um, interest in IPv6, um, whether they are successful in deploying it on any kind of reasonable time scale is another question entirely. Um, but uh, if you um, find yourselves in the position where you need to address those customers and you can't, you're also in an interesting situation. Thanks. Yep, that's part of what motivates my interest. Yes, sir. So for Alan and Shannon, I guess anyone else who feels I can contribute on this, uh, let's say I'm running a network and it's X. And if I can flip the switch and turn it to IPv6 overnight, uh, with IPv6 being less efficient to process, how much more hardware do I need? Do I need 1.8X? Do I need 5X? What, what, what does inefficiency cost me with regards to an increase in the amount of hardware? I'm not even talking about all the people behind it. I mean, V6 is inevitable. Give me an idea of what kind of commitment I can, might need to make at the worst case to actually get V6 running. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the, we have prototype typed the firmware for Linksys WRD54G, you know, used to. No, let's, let's talk about larger networks, larger devices. This is, this is the, the case where networks. you have to have large routing tables. They're double ah, because see. it's V4 yeah, and V6. I'm not worried about the Linksys okay. and you know, that, grandma that's a with core side. XP box mm, trying to go okay. to Vista. You know, in that case, that's up to his estimation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, now, and also the Juniper estimation to us, how much they charge us for the equipment. Okay. You know, please. You know, well, let them reduce that cost. But the, frankly speaking, in a, maybe the, yeah, maybe the doubled sometime, just because of the router table, just because the another box maybe. But then, uh, still, we cannot then, uh, you know, determine how much still we need to upgrade. But then, uh, at the core network of the NTT communications, or the backbone, and also that type of things, just in a, nothing different. We just turn on the IP version six feature on iOS or maybe the Junos. You know, that works. You know, then doesn't matter, you know, which protocol can go through on top of it. So still I'm not sure. Just, Sorry about that. Uh, just two observations and it'd be good to hear from uh, from Cisco and Juniper. Uh, my understanding is that the most notable cost may be at the very edge of the router, the edge cards, because that's where you do the forwarding tables. And if you have to have tables that are double uh, the size that they are today because they're doing V6 and V4, it could have a notable The V4 uh, network effect. is not nowhere near the size of the V4 network. It's not going to double. Your big costs are going to be in your infrastructure back end. It's going to be fixing your software to hold both kinds of addresses, et cetera, et cetera. You can go to all your routers today if you've bought them in the last last two years and turn on v6 right and run dual stack your cost is going to be the uh yeah, the problem just is, that chris the, wants the problem to throw is a rock at randy me. the problem is when you start to uh if you're doing any kind of qos if you're doing any kind of <clears throat> you do dual dual stack and the fib shrinks immediately so you're forcing us to go sideways because the boxes aren't getting any bigger so forcing us to go sideways means we're not going to do a dual stack because we can't 
So solve that problem for us. I, I would say the. The, the, first, the first thing, there is no generic question regarding the cost, and that the reason the first step we go when we are working on an IPv6 project is to do a network assessment. Because we, know, we need to know exactly what kind of hardware, what is the CPU load, what kind of feature people turn on on the box. From there, uh, if I look at any platform we do design today, we, we do v6 and v4 in hardware. So now, the real question is, what kind of feature do you need not only at the data plane when we are forwarding packets, because we know how to forward packets in IPv6, but what kind of control plane feature? And from there, if you look at the routing table, for example, do you need to handle the full v4 routing table plus the small v6 routing table? And from there, we need to look at what kind of memory size you need. At the same time, what kind of CPU processes you need for OSPF v3 or ISIS at the same time as OSPF. So it's really the combination of all features you have today for v4 plus what you want to add for V6, we need to understand. And from there, we can make recommendation. Uh, and that's the, that the reason for some of the customer, when we go through the network assessment, we can say, uh, yes, you can do it right now on this platform, or you may have to upgrade some software, you have to upgrade the, uh, the hardware, or, or maybe we don't have the right solution. And you, you can't provide any guideline without the network assessment. Uh, Elise, did you want to respond? Okay, so one of the um, things that we've heard often, and this is at the NANOG meetings as well as at Aaron meetings, is that there's concern about the routing tables, and I'll only talk to that piece. I think Patrick spoke to some of the other pieces. Um, I can't speak for Cisco, but it doesn't appear to me from the projections that everyone gives, and I think about 2 million routes of a mixture of V6 and V4 is what people are projecting for like the next five years. I think all of the routers that are out there now can do that. I don't think that that's an issue for routing tables. Oh, you're raising your hand. You're saying I can't? Uh, so I know that some, some Jupyter platforms cannot, that are in production in the field today. Little like ones. Asset, no, at large ISPs. Right. Go talk to Unit, talk to mm -hmm. Chile. I know what they're running there, yes. Specifically, mm -hmm. what doesn't work. Right. right. Where I used to work. And, right. and it's worse. It's that if an enterprise at the edge an enterprise cannot multi-home and be in the default free zone with an enterprise size router, we have lost. Tell us how big the IPv6 BFV is today. Thousands. <laughs> not, yet. Yeah. not yet. No, but I, I'm just attacking attacking specifically, at least saying all the routers can hold two million routes. B.S. <laughs> I was talking about the core uh, I and think not she was talking edge. about core routers. And that's what I thought the but question was, But what Randy, was, Randy's Randy. point is that if you wind up having to uh, handle the full routing tables closer to the edge or at the enterprise level, then that could be an issue. So we should take that into account. Otherwise, <coughs> otherwise, the enterprise at the edge becomes a slave to the upstream. You're back to TLA, all the things we fought and got rid of. Okay, let's keep going uh, and take note. Um, I'd like to address something that was brought up earlier in a question this guy asked. He was saying that uh, he likes you know, the end-to-end -end principle and uh, was disappointed that IPv6 seems to be going the way of IPv4. But uh, the way I understood it is that all this talk of NAT and NATPT and all that is really about you know, kind of beating IPv4 with a stick and crippling IPv4 further, but that there is no intention of, you know, using NAT on the IPv6 addresses, and that the intention is to to maintain the end-to-end -end stuff for IPv6. Is that correct, that we're not planning on doing any kind of crippling of the IPv6 network? That would have been my understanding. I think the um, PT was there to also help you get con connectivity with the parts of the net that aren't V6 yet. But is, is there a different view? Yes, unfortunately. OK, go for it. Um, that will be true if both ends are IPv6. And the question that has been raised several times was, should an IPv6 node that is talking through a translator to go to IPv4 know that the other end is IPv4? Should it be made aware of that or not? And there are really two schools of thought here. One says, no, I mean, it's V6, it's V6, and the fact that this translator has just broken legacy, and we are not going to carry this over for the next 20 years. Uh, the other school of thought is, 
well, we have this model now with uh, I, Stern, Turn, and all those very complex things to make a uh, fixed work through an ad box, and we're going to use exactly the same thing in IPv6 because we don't know if the other end is going to be v4 or v6, and we need to help the end nodes to make some decisions. And it's, in my mind, very much an open question now as which of those two models we're going to go to. But the ultimate principle is to restore the end-to-end -end idea. I mean, is that correct? That that's our ultimate goal? I'm not sure. Well, some of us would like it to be. Uh, yeah, at this point, it's really about I want to be able to keep adding customer to my network. That's really what it boils down to. Okay, next comment. I just thought I'd come back on this interesting uh, discussion about the size of the V6 routing table and the edge devices. <laughs> because I don't understand why everybody gets excited about it being V6 versus V4. Um, if you're going to multi-home or whatever you want to do as an enterprise, you can go ahead and do it right now on V6, get your AS, get some address space, and announce it. It's just the same on IPv6. In fact, shouldn't the IPv6 table be smaller? Because, I mean, everybody, once they get an AS, get an enormous amount of V6 space, so whereas now we have a lot of routes because we have fragmentation of the V4 space. I mean, in theory, we should be close to one announcement per ASN, and there's only 25,000 ASNs in the table. <laughs> Steve, you know better. <laughs> Look at all the ISPs that slice and dice to 24s because they don't want somebody to hijack their routes. Half of the bloody routing table is there because of idiocy, not because of a lack of aggregated address space. Traffic engineering. Traffic engineering, yeah. Oh, this is another, all right. <laughs> That's very true, right? Now let's keep this civil, folks. <laughs> All right. So uh, <clears throat> you have another uh, another question you want to raise? No, it's an Aaron thing, really. I was going to say the uh, you, you are right. You could fragment it if you wanted to, but I mean that's about our policy on where do we filter on the boundaries. I mean in V4 we filter on 24, which allows for a huge amount of prefixes to be announced. But um, on V6, I don't see why we. We can't, you know, stick a, a sensible numbers and, like, slash 32s and only hand out 32s to everyone who wants one. How are we going to do traffic engineering? How are we going to deal with people that have PA, sorry, PI 48s on it? No, no, no. That's going to be the same problem as we had in V4. How am I going to deal with a VP of marketing who says that Charlene called from over there and can't get her packets out because we filtered? That's the problem. <laughs> so it's about precedent, though. I mean, you, you, right now you can't Let's, route I was like the that. last filtering Nazi in V4. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you what happens. Okay, we now know People any conversation. People who wear clothes like Vint Randy, come to talk to you. Randy, <laughs> as, soon, as soon as the conversation mentions things like Nazi, you know that you need to stop that discussion. <laughs> so thank you for getting to the end point there, Randy. Okay. Uh, well, let's take two more, and then we really need to shut down. Go ahead. There was talk about uh, releasing class E address space to regular use. Uh, do you see that happening? And if yes, then uh, what kind of impact do you see? No. <laughs> we looked at this, and uh, it's actually the same cost to take all our equipment and certify it to work in 240-3, class E, than to certify it to move to V6. Why should we bother only to save a few slash eights? And so that's using don't it in private it. space. Yeah. You can't, the problem is you can't use it in public space, period, because where, where it might have solved the last problem, in private space, in public space, if I try to use it, that means you must have converted. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> last year, once a month, one class A, was disappeared. Actually, the more than that, within just 207, China took eight class A's, I guess. Then class E space has only 12, 16 <coughs> class E's. So only we can gain two years or yeah. less than that. At best. At best. At best. Yeah. So it yeah. doesn't not, work. Not, not I was a very thinking that I was hoping the same. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I see that uh, Eric is the last speaker, and I'm going to turn this over to you, Eric, because it's time to shut this thing down. Yeah, I hate to be the one to actually do it. I don't actually have a last question. I just want to deal with some mechanics. Um, we're going to break for lunch. We're back to start at 140.
Um, all of our guests, please take advantage of their time and escort them to lunch and so on and so forth. There are 14 seats reserved for the guests downstairs in case that's a problem. Um, and let's see. Uh, if any of you are leaving uh, and, and don't intend to be back after lunch, please let me know. Uh, and if that's the case, we should talk about the, um, the uh, release video release forms as well. Okay. But uh, please take advantage of the time, take them to lunch, be kind hosts, not too brutal. Uh, and we'll be back at 1.40. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very Thank much, you, Eric.